Hey, everybody. I have 17 reasons here why the summer of 2015 is the biggest watch we've ever looked at. First, as you probably know, both 2015 and 2016 mark the end of a 1260-year period that Adam Clark wrote in 1825 as the Tribulation Period. Matthew 24 says at the end of the tribulation of the days, the stars will fall, the sun and moon will go dark, and the rescue will occur. The Bible says days can also represent years, so it appears the 1260 days refers to 1260 years, which according to a 19th century author should end in either 2015 or 2016. Second, 2015 and 2016 appear to be the midst of Daniel's week, according to the recent fulfillments of Daniel chapter 9. Specifically, 2015 and 2016 are the last two years of that week, apparently. Third, 2015 is the 70th year from the creation of the eighth king. Revelation 17 says the eighth king will be the last, and Jeremiah 25 says the nations around Judah will serve Babylon 70 years, and at the end of that 70-year period, the whole world will drink the cup of wrath. That cup of wrath is code for the asteroid impact, so we have both the 1260-year tribulation of the days and the 70 years of the UN 8th King ending in 2015. Fourth, 2015 is the year of the sheep and the goat, and once we really start to examine the fulfilled prophecies of the Bible, at least for me, it becomes overwhelmingly clear that it was written by people who actually knew the future. They weren't just seeing visions. So for example, Jesus and Gabriel knew precise details about the future. So when Jesus used the riddle of the sheep and the goats to describe those who will be rescued and taken to a safe place and those who will stay behind to try to tough it out on the earth, that may have been a reference to 2015, the year of the sheep and the goat. Number five, June 12th through the 14th this year marks one year from the ISIS massacre that started the war, and this ties into the flood story in the Bible and also the chapter in Revelation that talks about the events after the asteroid impact. So you might remember this 40-day pattern that has been playing out since June of last year. Specifically, it started on June 12th through the 15th in 2014, which was our big watch date last year because of the 777 timeline. So everyone knows about the stock market crashes in 2001 and 2008 that both occurred on the Jewish Feast of Trumpets and both on a sabbatical year. And most people know the stock market crash in 2008 dropped exactly 777 points. But what many people don't know is that Hurricane Sandy hit New York City four years after that 777, and it was recorded as the worst flood in New York City history. In the Genesis story of Noah's flood, we're told his father Lamech died at age 777 when Noah was 595 years old, and the flood hit when Noah was 600 years old. So if the flood hit when Noah was in the beginning of his 600th year, that would be four years after Lamech died at 777. And if Noah was at the end of his 600th year, then that's five years after the 777. And finally, if the begatting of Noah refers to his conception, then we add the 280 days of a human pregnancy to that timeline. So what we're looking at here seems to be only part of a larger pattern that started on the 9-11 tragedy. So anybody who's listened to Rabbi Khan knows about the stock market crashes on the sabbatical years in 2001 and 2008. And they also know the next sabbatical is in 2015, and apparently it's a jubilee year. So there's only one jubilee every 50 years in the Bible. You probably already know that. But this adds to that because Hurricane Sandy, the worst flood in New York City history, hit four years after the 777, and that represented the beginning of Noah's 600th year. The end of that 600th year would have been the following year in 2013, and since the 777 occurred on the Feast of Trumpets, we can consider the Feast of Trumpets 2013 as the end of Noah's 600th year on this timeline. 280 days later, the length of a human pregnancy ended on June 11th through the 13th, 2014. We looked at all of this in a video I uploaded on February 2014. Back then, I didn't know what the event would be. I, might, I thought it might have something to do with the Bible prophecy of the asteroid impact, the falling of the stars, the seven trumpets. But what occurred on that date was the Islamic State Camp Spiker massacre that was the catalyst for the war against the Islamic State that we've gone into this past year. So while it seems on the surface to have nothing to do with the asteroid, it actually does have something to do with it. The one place in the Bible prophecy that predicts the rise of the Islamic State seems to be in Revelation chapter 9. And 
Revelation 9 is all about the asteroid impact. It says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So some argue that this cannot be an asteroid because it uses the word key and an asteroid impact crater is not bottomless. I agree there's probably another layer to this, but as we've seen before, these scriptures contain multiple layers of fulfillments. So one of the layers of this is clearly the asteroid impact because it says the smoke that comes out of the pit darkens the air in the sky, and that's the reason the sun and the moon go dark. So Jesus was clear in Matthew 24 that the sun and the moon go dark when the stars fall from heaven. And Jesus referred us to the book of Daniel. And Daniel is clear that the beast will be destroyed by a stone that is cut out without hands. He also describes it as a burning flame. So it's a burning flame stone. Revelation 18 verse 21 is also clear that Babylon the Great will be destroyed by a millstone that is thrown into, sea, into the sea by an angel. So the texts are talking about a stone that falls from heaven. It's also referred to as the rock in the text. We, so we all know there are multiple layers in these texts. So the falling star in Revelation 9 refers on one level to the asteroid impact that the texts are clear will destroy Babylon, the great city. But after the star hits and the smoke rises out of the pit, it says locusts come out of the smoke. And this is very strange. It says in verses 7 and 8, that the shapes of the locusts were like horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were the, as the faces of men. It says they had the hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And this is a mystery that Joel 2 talks about as well. It's talking about the day of the Lord and the strange people. It says the day of the Lord comes, a day of clouds and thick darkness, and a great people and a strong there hath not been ever the like. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing shall escape them. So we know the day of the Lord refers to the day the asteroid hits, and we know Joel 2 is talking about the locusts here, because in verse 25 it says, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. So these strange people described starting in verse 2 are referred to symbolically as locusts, and it clearly tells us they appear at the day of the Lord in the day of clouds and thick darkness. That's what Revelation 9 tells us is the asteroid impact. The locusts come out after the asteroid hits and the sunlight is dampened out from the smoke or ash from the pit. So the detail about the strange appearance of the locusts is important because it ties into the image that is explained in detail in Genesis 3 and Isaiah 3. It's a technology that alters their appearance. So it seems clear from our previous examinations of Genesis 3 that at the time of the asteroid impact, their image technology will be taken away and they will no longer appear as beautiful humans, but their true form will be visible. Joel 2 refers to these non-humans as locusts. It says, I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. The word locust seems to be symbolic because these people eat away at the earth like a plague. It says in verse 3, the land is as the Garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. And in verse 8, it says, when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. And in verse 9, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Jesus said he will knock on the door, but anyone who enters in any other way is a thief. In 2 Peter 3 verse 10, it says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So Joel 2 is talking about the day of the Lord, the asteroid impact, and the locusts that come out after that. In verse 10, it says the earth shall quake, the sun and moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. So again, in Revelation 9, it says the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke that rises out of the pit, and that pit is caused by the star that falls from heaven. So on one level, it's the rock, the burning stone, the millstone, the falling stars, the asteroid impact. Then Joel 2 verse 16 confirms that the bridegroom will go forth of his chamber at that point and the bride out of her closet. So notice Revelation 18 confirms that again, it says in verse 21, a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down. In verse 23, it says, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. So that confirms Joel 2 and Revelation 9 are referring to the asteroid impact. This table right here shows some of the connections between Joel 2, Revelation 9, and Revelation 18. 
So it's clear the star that falls from heaven represents on one level the asteroid impact and the locusts sound like non-humans that appear out of the smoke. But from our examination of Genesis 3, we know that the texts are indicating that the non-humans are already here. They indicate that it started around 1947 at the time of the feet. But the Bible says they're using an image technology that makes them appear beautiful. But at the wrath, in other words, the asteroid impact, it says that image disguise will be removed. So to the average person, it's going to seem like these locusts appeared out of the smoke of the pit, but in reality, they've already been here since 1947. It's just that people will see them for what they really are after the asteroid hits. But the bride and the bridegroom will not be here at that time. The texts tell us throughout that the rescue occurs at the same time as the asteroid impact. But here's where the Islamic State comes in. Revelation 9 verse 14 says after that asteroid hits, an army will be loosened in the Euphrates River and kill the humans in the third part of the earth. So I just want to say this really quick before we move on. Verse 14 does seem to be a slight mistranslation because we know the four angels are the ones that hold back the winds when they seal the 144,000. The texts tell us that. So the four angels here in verse 14, we know they're the ones that hold back the winds. This verse is telling us that they are going to loosen something. So they're going to loosen those that are bound in the great river Euphrates. So when it says that um, they were prepared for an hour a day, a month, and a year to slay the third part of the men. And right after that, in verse 16, it says, and the number of the army was 200,000. It's telling us the army is what is going to slay the third part of the men, not the angels. The four angels are the ones that hold back the winds to while the 144,000 are sealed on the earth. So it's saying here in verses 14, 15, that, and also 16, that, um, the army that is prepared, that is bound in the great river Euphrates, it says the four angels will loosen them. And it says that army was prepared for an hour a day, a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. So we know from our examination of the seven trumpets that the trumpets represent the asteroid impact and they occur in one day. The third part of the earth is where the asteroid hits. So Revelation 9 is telling us that the army that comes out of the Euphrates will kill those living in the location where the asteroid hits. And this is after the asteroid hits. And it says the army will prepare to do that for a day, a month, and a year. So we know the Islamic State rose out of the Euphrates River. We also know the Camp Spiker massacre occurred on a biblically significant date last year. And that's what started the war that we're in now. We also know that events started a series of events occurring roughly every 40 days, and that series will end in 2015 on the same exact date that it started on the massacre last year. And this is how it connects to the flood timeline. In the story of Noah, the flood comes in his 600th year, and the flood waters stay on the earth for a full year of 365 days. So there are multiple congruencies this year in 2015 that line up with that timeline that started last year. The timeline here that started on the 777 in 2008 and ended on June 11th through the 13th, 2014, also lined up with the actual date of the flood on the ancient calendar. That started a 40-day period, which led to another 40-day period and another and another. In fact, the 40-day warnings have continued for an entire year, and this next 40-day watch lands on the exact date the timeline started on last year. But that's not all. That final 40-day watch lands on the exact date, biblically, that Noah exited the ark on the ancient calendar. I'm sorry, I don't know if that's the final watch, but the next one lands on that the biblical date that Noah exited the ark. So last year in 2014, Noah's flood date, the 17th day of the second month on the ancient calendar, landed on June 13th through the 15th. And this year, the date Noah exits the ark on the ancient calendar lands on the same date, June 13th through the 15th. So again, 
the ISIS massacre that started the war last year occurred on the exact date of Noah's flood on the ancient calendar. It started a series of 40-day fulfillments that are lining up with the exact date they started on last year. And that date is also the exact biblical date on the ancient calendar that Noah exited the ark exactly 365 days after the rain started. But also in Revelation 9 verse 15, we're told the army out of the Euphrates will be prepared for roughly a year. So that one year period from June 2014 to June 2015, it may be significant. I don't know. Um, but the next watch window is June 12th through the 14th. And that also seems to tie in with these things here. Um, June 13th and 14th was the first Shavuot in 1948 after Israel was declared a nation. We know we're in the 67th year from that, which is the exact length of one generation in the book of Matthew. June 13th and 14th was also true Shavuot on the ancient calendar in 2013. It was the end of Noah's timeline in 2014. And this year in 2015, it will be the date Noah exited the ark and also the next 40-day watch exactly one year from the Islamic State massacre last year that started the war. June 14th is also U.S. Flag Day, and you, we remember the U.S. flag was dropped in unison with the lyric, Our Flag Was Still There, on Obama's birthday at the London Olympics in 2012. That was two days after the abomination of desolation stood in the hallowed place. And before we move on to the next event, I just want to point out something about Joel 2, verse 23, where it says he will cause to come down for you the rain in the first month. We don't know if this refers to the rain of fire and brimstone or if it refers to the ancient calendar. The first month of the biblical calendar starts in the springtime, and we know it typically rains in the spring. So from what I can tell, there are at least three possible meanings for this verse. Number one, it may simply refer to the spring rains. Number two, it may refer to the rain of fire and brimstone, which would be the timing of the asteroid impact. Or number three, it may be giving us a clue that the standard calendar is off by one month. Remember, Daniel said the little horn will change the times, and the texts tell us the country of Israel is the little horn, and the standard Jewish calendar may be coming from Israel. I don't know, but... It does not match the ancient biblical calendar, and I've noticed that the rains do not seem to start until the second month on the standard Jewish calendar, which is the first month on the ancient calendar. So um, that might explain why the Bible tells us to gauge the calendar by the movements of the sun and the moon to make sure that we're in that we're on the right calendar. So we we do follow that ancient biblical calendar on this channel, and it shows us that the first month has been starting generally one month after the standard calendar. So we know the ancient calendar is right because the Revelation 12 sign occurred on the ancient calendar appointment of trumpets in 2012. So verse 23 in Joel 2 may be giving us a clue that the standard calendar created by the little horn is a month off. So telling us when we see the rains, we are in the first month, not the second month. So this is important because the majority of people are following the standard calendar, not the ancient biblical calendar. The standard calendar had the wheat harvest of Shavuot on Memorial Day this year, but the ancient calendar has the wheat harvest of Shavuot on June 20th and 21st in 2015. And that brings up the next point. Number six, the wheat harvest of Shavuot on the ancient calendar lands on Father's Day this year, which is interesting because Jesus said, those who are rescued will go to the Father's house, and that rescue represents the wheat being gathered into the barn. So Shavuot is always a watch for that reason because it's a wheat harvest, but um, on June 20th and 21st, the last day of spring and the first day of summer this year, and also Father's Day, that's going to be the wheat harvest of Shavuot on the ancient calendar in 2015. Notice Joel 2 makes a reference to the wheat harvest right after it says the rain will come down in the first month. So verse 24 says, and the floors shall be full of wheat. So it says, the rains will come down in the first month and the floors shall be full of wheat. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten and you shall eat in plenty. So that may be a clue to watch the ancient calendar. Make sure the rain is coming down in the first month. In other words, make sure you're watching the right calendar the way the Bible says to do it. And count the days from the first month to the wheat harvest, which is the counting of the Omer to Shavuot. 
So I don't know if that's a meaning of Joel too, but it could be. And again, this year in 2015, the wheat harvest on the ancient calendar occurs on the last day of spring and the first day of summer on Father's Day. And that's a reference to both the, both the wheat harvest and the rescue to the father's house. So next, number seven, July 1st marks our entry into the time frame that is three and a half years before the end of the affliction. So in the last video, we looked at the 430 years of sojourning from Abraham to the Exodus. And in that video, we found that the Bible is clear that the Israelites were only in Egypt for 215 years, not 400. So the question many scholars have asked is, where are the 400 years of affliction as described in Genesis 15? So notice Exodus 12 verse 40 says, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. But Genesis 15 verse 13 says, he said to Abraham, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. So not 430, but 400 years. So the texts are clear the 430 years ended at the Exodus, but scholars argue about where the 400 years of affliction are. So some have said that Deuteronomy 28 has the answer, and I agree. Deuteronomy 28 says, starting around verse 25, that they will be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. They will be oppressed and their children given away, and the Lord will bring them into a nation which neither they nor their fathers have known. That verse right there, verse 36, it's they're going to be taken into a nation which neither they nor their fathers have known. So that's not Egypt on, in Africa. Um, it says they will work in the land, but not reap of it. They will serve their enemies in nakedness. And it even mentions the eagle in verse 49. And it mentions a nation of fierce countenance in verse 50, which we know refers to the United Nations from our examination of, of Daniel. It says he shall eat the fruit of your land. So here it seems to be talking about the UN presence in Africa. It says there will be plagues and the diseases of Egypt. So that sounds like the pale horse of death and war, the fourth horse of the fourth seal. We talk about that in the video on the seven seals. The fourth part of the earth seems to be Africa and the Middle East. And those famines started around 1948. So Deuteronomy 28 seems to be talking about Africa here. Then starting in verse 63, it says you shall be plucked off from the land and the Lord shall scatter thee from one end of the earth to the other. And then verse 68 says, the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships and there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bond men and bond women. So we know the Israelites were in Egypt 215 years, but in Deuteronomy 28, it says some of them will go into Egypt again with ships this time. And Revelation 11 tells us Egypt is the symbolic name for Babylon the Great, which we found in a previous video, refers to this whole area in pink here, where all types worship the beast. This whole area is known symbolically as Egypt, and it encompasses America. So Deuteronomy 28 seems to refer to the inhabitants of Africa that came to America on ships and brought into slavery. And it seems to describe this in detail. So if this refers to the 400 year affliction that so many Bible scholars have failed to find, then that affliction should end in the next few years because they first arrived in America on those ships in 1619. 400 years later is 2019. So if that 400 years is the affliction, then for it to end completely in the next four years, it seems something major would have to occur. The final tribulation is three and a half years and the end of the 400 year affliction would have to be after, not before the final tribulation. So three and a half years before the end of that 400 years in 2019 would be 2015. So subtract three and a half years, in other words, subtract three years and six months from January 1st, 2019, and it lands on July 1st, 2015. The window then for the start of the tribulation prior to the end of the 400 years of affliction in 2019 would last from July 1st, 2015 until three and a half years before the last day of 2019. So subtract three years and six months from December 31st, 2019, and it lands on June 30th, 2016. 
So we're about to enter the one-year window on July 1st this year for the rescue and start of tribulation if the affliction is to end in 2019. So the next point is number eight. July 4th is exactly 10 years from the day the Deep Impact spacecraft made contact with Comet Temple 1. Michio Kaku made a statement in the Deep Impact episode of Sci-Fi Science that I thought was interesting, and it may not mean anything, but he was talking about a hypothetical situation in which an asteroid was due to hit the Earth, and he said we might have a chance of moving the asteroid off course if we planted rockets on the asteroid a decade before it was due to hit. So I'm just going to play a few minutes of the episode right here. 90% of the rocks in space are big enough to destroy civilization. And it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It's official. Earth is in danger. Two, one, zero. I'm devising a plan to save it. Along the way, I get advice from the sci-fi loving public. We just have to move it. Deflected. Laser technology is always good. To rescue our planet from asteroid Armageddon. I think it can be done, and I'm going to show you how. I'm Dr. Michio Kaku. I'm a theoretical physicist and a science fiction fan. Join me as I show you how to make sci-fi science. Well, there goes the neighborhood. If that was the Earth, we're talking about a blast wave that would flatten all of South America. And then the firestorms will engulf the entire planet. And whatever is left will be drowned by a gigantic tsunami. In other words, we just witnessed the death of an entire planet. is in danger from killer asteroids, and I'm on a mission to save it. Nukes are a no-go. Blowing up an asteroid will doom Earth, not save it. Maybe I don't need to destroy the asteroid. I just need to move it. And I have one thing working in my favor, time. All asteroids have long, predictable trajectories. Strike! If I know what path it's going to travel, then I know by how much I have to change its course to avoid Armageddon. Detonating a nuclear bomb on the surface or on the inside of an asteroid, that could do more harm than good. So maybe there's another way, a more subtle way. Maybe we could simply push it out of the way when the asteroid is still very distant. Some scientists have suggested attaching rockets to the asteroid. If the rockets fired continuously for a decade before it was due to hit, it's veering off to the right. I think they'd nudge the asteroid just enough to avoid catastrophe. Okay, so I don't know if you caught that. He said if the rockets fire continuously for a decade, they might be able to veer it off course. So I'll just play it back real quick for you. If the rockets fired continuously for a decade before it was due to hit, if the rockets fired continuously for a decade before it was due to hit, the rockets fired continuously for a decade before it was due to hit. Continuously for a decade before for a decade before it for a decade before it was due to hit. Okay, so he's saying hypothetically, of course, if they were able to plant rockets on the asteroid ten years before the asteroid was due to hit, then they might be able to move it off course. Well, Again, the name of this episode was Deep Impact, and there was a spacecraft named Deep Impact that apparently successfully collided. They're trying to say they released an impactor into Comet Temple 1. I don't know if that's true or not. That's just what they're telling us. But they say that um, successfully happened 10 years ago, July 4th, 2005. 
Um, and then the spacecraft deep, deep impact lost communication in September of 2013. And in this episode named Deep Impact, he says if they could plant rockets on it 10 years before it was due to impact Earth, they might be able to veer it off course. So that may be telling us something, I don't know. The Deep Impact spacecraft made contact with the comet 10 years ago. So were they expecting an impact 10 years after that in 2015? I don't know. It's possible. And this is kind of strange right here. You may have seen this already. This YouTuber uploaded a clip last year from the TV show Third Rock from the Sun. I'll just play a clip of it right here. And yet everyone on the planet gets all worked up about these pointless little behaviors, blissfully unaware of the great vaporizing meteor due in 2015. <laughs> blissfully unaware of the great vaporizing meteor due in 2015. Of the great vaporizing meteor due in 2015. Blissfully unaware of the great vaporizing meteor due in 2015. <laughs> so this episode aired in 1996 two years before the movie deep impact that is about a comet hitting the earth and at least nine things depicted in this movie have occurred in real life since its release in 1998 one of the nine things depicted in the movie that happened later was the landing of a spacecraft on the comet to plant explosives. So again, we know we know Hollywood depicted the 9-11 tragedy in films and television before the event. So it's possible this movie was a release of the information in a plausibly deniable way. And again, in this episode of sci-fi science named Deep Impact, Michio Kaku says if they could plant rockets on it 10 years before it was due to impact Earth, they might be able to veer it off course. So we've got the Deep Impact spacecraft that reached its destination in July 2005, 10 years ago. The Deep Impact episode of Sci-Fi Science saying we could plant rockets on the asteroid 10 years before it was due to hit. And the Deep Impact movie about a comet hitting Earth, which seems to highlight Obama's presidency 10 years before he was elected. And Obama's presidency is also highlighted in the ancient book of Daniel. Also notice in this Deep Impact episode, he says it's official. And then they show a map of the Americas and they drop the melon onto a portion of South America. I'll just play this really quick. We're talking about a blast wave that would flatten all of South America. And then the firestorms will engulf the entire planet. And okay, so you can see Florida is right here. This is where they had the asteroid hitting. That's the top of South America. And we'll look into that later. So next, in number nine here, we have a large military drill that will be held in seven southern states from July 15th to September 15th. It's called Jade Helm 15. And I'm going to play this news clip that was just released last night in case you're unfamiliar with this. Jade Helm 15, a military training exercise that will take, pla take place in Texas and six other states, has been the subject of rumor and conspiracy across the Internet. The designation of Texas as hostile territory has fueled those concerns, but it is the beginning of an invasion, that it could be the beginning of an invasion of Texas, as some believe, or is it just part of military war games? Investigative reporter Shaley Sanders has spoken with local officials and those involved in Jade Helm 15 to get the facts. She joins us now with the latest. Shaley? Karen and Abner, Jade Helm 15 is a multi-state Department of Defense approved training exercise that will take place across these seven states. The leak of unclassified military documents has fueled a lot of rumors and conspiracy theories on the internet. This page especially, you can see here, it labels Texas, Utah, and a portion of California as hostile territories. The Army says these were notes used to brief local level government officials on the exercise, and the labels were just for training purposes. However, some residents are still concerned. So you said you've received hundreds of questions about Jade Helm 15. There's a lot of hysteria. Hundreds. Hundreds of emails, hundreds of phone calls. Some of them have been frantic. Lubbock County Judge Tom Head, who is the statutory county director of emergency management, 
says he began looking into Jade Helm 15 a little more than a month ago. Uh, in the course of my investigations, I have not found any concrete verifiable evidence to make me think that it's anything other than a military training exercise. From what I understand, uh, nothing concerning Jade Helm is going to be above Interstate 20. We requested a list of Texas counties that would be included in the military exercise. They are spread out across the state. The Public Affairs Office tells us portions of the training will take place on public property coordinated with government officials and also on private land volunteered by landowners. And while some are happy to help... We're training these, the military and the special operations people specifically to go out and defend our country. Others remain skeptical. Everybody's on edge. Everybody has a lot of questions. I think the military could do a little better job explaining what their intentions are. Lieutenant Colonel Mark Lastoria, the U.S. Army Special Operations Command spokesman, spent two hours answering residents' questions at a meeting in Bastrop County. We're going to be doing this, uh, conducting the training exercise safely and courteously. We're not going to interfere with their privacy or their rights with this. But still, some are unconvinced. Would the court be offended if I told the colonel that I didn't believe a single word that he just said? Colonel Lastoria told us part of the concern surrounding these exercises stems from the leak of these unclassified documents, which labels Texas as a hostile state. This is in preparation for the financial collapse and, and maybe even Obama not leaving office. I mean, I'm telling you, this is so huge. They're preparing to initiate martial law and maybe even roundups. This is not... Um, a joke. It, it's it's the real deal. But according to these U.S. Special Operations Command documents that Colonel Astoria provided, Jade Helm has nothing to do with martial law, and U.S. Army personnel will not be used as domestic law enforcement. Colonel Astoria confirms about 1,200 Army personnel will be involved in this eight-week around-the-clock training that begins July 15th. So why these seven states? We're told the diverse terrain replicates areas special operations soldiers regularly find themselves operating in overseas and provides realistic training environments in terms of challenging terrain, distance, borders, and population density. But with concerns still lingering, Governor Greg Abbott ordered the Texas State Guard to monitor military personnel movements and training exercise schedules and ensure that safety and constitutional rights of Texans were not being violated. And what does Lubbock County's Director of Emergency Operations advise? Have a plan. Just be ready for anything that happens. Don't be surprised, but don't jump to conclusions. I think there's a, been a lot of uh, misinformation. I think there's been a lot of speculation and conjecture, probably because a lot of West Texas people don't trust the federal government. And I think that's kind of fueled it a little bit. But I haven't seen any evidence to make me think that Jade Helm is anything other than just a training exercise. Okay, so this is going to be held from Florida to Utah, only in the southern states. And my first thought when I saw this was that it might have something to do with the asteroid impact. We were talking about this same basic area in this video last October. I'll leave the link below. But this map was based partially on the Batman map strike zones. The Batman map shows five strike zones on what looks like the United States and this area at the bottom kind of resembles Texas. And if we look closer, we can see it says Sandy Hook and the 35 freeways going through it. So the 35 goes through Texas. It starts in Laredo and goes up through San Antonio, Fort Worth, and then further north. And so you can see I put the 35 right here. And there's a town called Sandy Point that's right on the coast of Texas right on that hook of Texas. So I know a lot of people think that this right here represents Sandy Hook in Connecticut, and it probably does on one level, but I think it also represents the coast of Texas, the hook of Texas. So notice it says strike zone one, which personally I think has to do with the asteroid. So this is the same area um, where the military drill will be held this summer, and it's only about 20 degrees north of the location that the episode Deep Impact showed the hypothetical asteroid hitting, which was right in here. So that episode of Deep Impact aired five years ago in 2010, and they showed the asteroid hitting in this area right here around 10 degrees latitude in the northern portion of South America. And you can see Florida is at the 30 degrees latitude. So in the past five years, since they aired that episode, 
I don't know, it's possible that their projected trajectory moved 20 degrees north or maybe not. I don't know. I'm just saying it's possible. Um, maybe they're covering all their bases 20 to 20 degrees north and maybe also 20 degrees south. I don't know what they're doing in South America. But anyway, that that military drill, it might have something to do with that. It's possible. But also notice Texas is in red and notice the circle right here. So this ties into a dream I had about Texas in June of 2013. It's in the playlist Proof the Visions Come True because the part about the people being held captive in the house came true a, a year later. But I still think the rest of the dream might be important. In short, I dreamt that I saw a freeway and the words Lone Star State Highway in the number 10, which I guess must refer to the 10 freeway as it passes through Texas. I also saw a smaller highway under that 10 freeway and it was running parallel to the 10. So I think that might refer to the 90. So in the, the 90 is right here. So in the dream, there were two towns below the 90 on top of each other running perpendicular to the 90. So I didn't really think anything over here matched what I saw in the dream, but this triangle right here southwest of San Antonio might be the location in my dream because these towns, La Prior, Crystal City, and Carrizo Springs look almost exactly like what I saw. The towns were, like I said, in a straight line running perpendicular to the 90. And I saw the words next to the towns, but I couldn't remember what they were exactly, but it was something like right here or this one. And I don't know what that meant. Also on the 90 itself, I saw the words, and this one is lonely too, meaning the Lone Star State Highway up here, the 10, and the highway under it, the 90, were alone, not joined together. So I'm just guessing. I actually don't know if the 10 is the Lone Star State Highway. Um, I just was thinking it was the 10 because I saw the number 10 in my vision. So again, I'm, I don't know for sure if that's what it is, but I do feel like this area right here looks just, it, it really looks like what I saw, that the cities that I saw running perpendicular to that highway right here, it just, it just looks very similar. So I feel like this area right here is what I saw in my dream. Again, I don't know why I saw that. I also noticed that it looks like the 90 and the 10 um, joined together for a while east of San Antonio. So it seems like the dream was not of this area unless it refers to the area south of the alternate route 90. Um, because I, in the dream, again, um, it said, you know, this highway is the Lone Star State Highway and the, and the highway under it was lonely too. So it, to me, that meant that they were not joined together. So you can see they're joined together right here, east of San Antonio, but in my dream, because it, it seemed to say that they were separate. So we're looking for a location where the 90 and the 10 are separate from each other. So it doesn't seem like it's in this area here, although I could be wrong. Um, the 90 then joins up with the 147 here, east of Houston, and then it goes on into... Um, Louisiana, I think, is, is the next state over. So it seems like the dream was pointing to a location south of the 90 where the 90 is not joined with another highway. I don't know what it meant, but it showed two vertical towns in a straight line south of the 90. And like I said, this triangle um, southwest of San Antonio from Laredo to San Antonio to Del Rio looks like the area I saw in the dream, specifically these towns that seem to be La Prior, Crystal City or Carrizo Springs because the 90 is completely alone right here and the towns are vertical right on top of each other just like I saw in the dream. Again, I don't know what it means, but I just wonder because of this military drill that they're having and that's a location we've looked at for a few years now. And I was also shown something in the area of what seemed like Oklahoma, so I, I don't know. Um, but Notice the map they showed on KCBD shows the counties where the drill will be held in Texas. And notice the bulk of those are right here above this curve right here of Texas. So I can't read the names of the counties right here, but it's somewhere in here. So you can see Valverde County is right here on the curve and right next to that 
is Edwards. So I'll just show you this, this map again. You can see this right here looks like La Verde County. So you can see, I'm sorry, Valver Valverde County. You can see that right there. It looks like the, that's what county that is. And right next to that one is Edwards. So it looks like it might be highlighting Edwards County and Kimball and a few others in this area right here. I'll just show you that again. So it looks like this is Edwards. That might be Kimball. And that is very close to the area that I saw in the dream. You can see Edwards is just north of the 90 right in here, just barely northwest of the two towns that I saw in the dream, Crystal City right here and Carrizo Springs. And the other one is along the 57 right here. And that is La Prior. So that is very strange to me. Again, I saw this location two years ago in a dream. Part of the dream came true a year later. So I don't know if there's more to it or not. I'll leave the link below if you want to watch that video. But the bulk of the military drills in Texas is very close to this location. It's right up in here. So I wonder if that has something to do with the asteroid or comet impact. And they're expecting it somewhere from the lower portion of the United States, or maybe even as far down as the northern tip of South America. Again, I don't know that. It's just speculation. But these bits of information are fitting together like a puzzle for years now. And it's starting to form a picture. So both the location of the drill and the timing of the drill is lining up with what we've examined about where and when the asteroid might hit for years now. And notice the next point, number 10, aligns almost exactly with those drill dates, July 16th through August 13th. And that will be the 10th month on the ancient calendar in the Southern Hemisphere. And only in 2015, this 10th month will be the seventh year of the king. It's Obama's seventh year and Obama's presidency was not only highlighted by Gabriel and Daniel 9, but it also seems to have been highlighted in the movie Deep Impact. I'll just play a clip right here. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Hello, everybody. So this movie, Deep Impact, that was released 10 years before Obama was elected, seems to have highlighted his presidency, and more specifically, the Book of Daniel highlighted his presidency. So 2015 is Obama's seventh year as president, and the 10th month in the seventh year of the king is the time that the bride is taken in the biblical story of Esther. And that 10th month on the ancient calendar in the southern hemisphere starts one day after that military drill starts. The number 11, the entire month of August, is perfectly highlighted by the budding of the fig tree in 1948. In the previous video, we calculated the exact number of years in one generation. Jesus said, Matthew 24, that once the fig tree Israel buds, everything on his timeline will occur within one generation. The only event left on Jesus' timeline in Matthew 24 is the rescue and the asteroid impact, which occurs simultaneously. And one generation is equal to a maximum of 67 years and 79 days, according to the book of Matthew. So 67 years and 79 days from the exact date Israel was declared a nation, the fig tree on May 14th, 1948, lands on August 1st, 2015, and 67 years and 79 days from the first Shavuot in 1948 lands on August 31st, 2015. The date the nation of Israel was declared in the spring of 1948 seems to have been highlighted by Jesus as the budding of the fig tree in the springtime, and Shavuot in 1948 seems to have been highlighted by Gabriel in Daniel 9 as the first Shavuot after the going forth of the commandment to restore Jerusalem. So one generation after these two dates lands exactly on August 1st and August 31st, 2015. It perfectly highlights the month of August. And also August is the month that the first ship from Africa arrived in Jamestown in 1619. So August 2015 is exactly four years prior to the end of the 400 years of affliction. Number 12, August 2nd, 2015, is exactly three years from the abomination of desolation that was placed in 2012. The idol of terror lifted into the hallowed place, the One World Trade Center, exactly 1290 days after Obama took the oath of office. 
This was a precise fulfillment of the Bible prophecy in Daniel 9 and Daniel 12. And we know three days is significant in the Bible and days can also represent years. So three years from the abomination of desolation Daniel talked about that Jesus told us to watch for. Three years from that lands exactly on August 2nd, 2015. So we're not told the amount of time between that event and the escape. But again, three days or three years is a significant number in the text. Number 13, August 6th through the 9th is exactly 70 years from the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I have a video on the 70 years of Jeremiah and Isaiah where I present the possibility that Japan may actually represent the sinking island of Tarshish, of which 70 years is a key component to the end times prophecy. Number 14, August 16th is the actual date given in the movie Deep Impact that the comet hits the earth. Again, at least nine things in that movie have already come true after it was released. Jesus said we won't know the day or the hour, so I'm not saying that's it, but it is a watch and it is occurring in the month that the one generation highlights. Okay, so now we're going to look at why September may not be the time of the impact, as many are saying. First, September 7th, 2015 is the final day of the one generation from the budding of the fig tree in the spring of 1948. The book of Matthew tells us the maximum number of years that one generation represents in the book of Matthew is 67 years and 79 days. The one generation starts in the spring at the budding of the fig tree Israel. If that refers to the year Israel became a nation, then one generation from the last day of spring in 1948 ends September 7th, 2015. Jesus said one generation will not pass before the rescue and the asteroid hits. That means it will not occur after September 7th, 2015 if the budding of the fig tree was the spring of 1948. Number 16, Joel 2.32 says the sun will go dark and the moon will turn to blood before the day of the Lord. We know the day of the Lord is also known as the day of wrath and it refers to the asteroid impact. Some have suggested that the sun going dark and the moon turning to blood refers to a solar and lunar eclipse. 2015 is an important eclipse year because all of the solar and lunar eclipses are occurring on the biblical feast days. According to Mark Biltz, this is rare and won't happen again for another 400 years. It usually occurs over a period of two years, and this time it occurred in 2014 and 2015. However, I don't know if this has been pointed out yet, but in 2014, the order of the eclipses did not match Joel 2. He said the sun goes dark first, then the moon turns red. In other words, the solar eclipse is first, then the lunar eclipse. So you might notice in 2014, the lunar eclipses were first, then the solar eclipse both times in the spring and fall of 2014. So it was backwards. But in 2015, the solar eclipses occur first, both in the spring and fall. So in the spring of 2015, we had a solar eclipse first, followed by a lunar eclipse. So it matched the order of the eclipses in Joel 2. And again, it wasn't just any solar and lunar eclipse. They fell on the biblical feast days. So we're in a high watch right now until the end of August because the sun went dark and the moon turned to blood before the time period that we're in right now. The next eclipses occur in September, so once we reach September 1st, it seems we'll no longer be in the period after the eclipses, but instead we'll be in the period before the eclipses. So Joel 2 indicates the asteroid impact will occur after the eclipses. So we could even take this further and count the days between the lunar eclipse of April 4th and the solar eclipse of September 13th. There are 162 days between the lunar eclipse of April 4th and the solar eclipse of September 13th. So if we divide this by two, we get the number of days that are technically after the sun and moon went dark in April. So if we take 162 and divide that by two, we get exactly 81. And 81 days after the sun went dark and the moon turned to blood, this spring ends on June 24th. So it might be a little too technical to think June 24th enters into the time period before the eclipses this fall. I mean, I don't know. But once we reach September 1st, we're definitely before the eclipses and not after. So Joel 2 indicates the eclipses will occur before the day of the Lord not after. But we also know that word in Joel 2, it has multiple meanings. So who knows? I'm not saying this to discredit anyone's theory about the fall feast. I'm just trying to point out that there are a lot of reasons it could also happen before that this summer. And the most important reason for that seems to be that Jesus' one generation is ending this summer. 
And finally, number 17, Jesus said, pray your flight is not in the winter. There are at least two ways to look at this. First of all, it could mean that the rescue and asteroid will not happen in the winter. And if that's the case, then we also need to consider the southern hemisphere because Jesus said true Israel refers to the whole world. Winter in the southern hemisphere occurs when it's summer in the northern hemisphere. So if Jesus meant that the rescue will not occur in winter, then that means it won't occur in either winter or summer. But that statement, pray your flight is not in the winter, has another possible meaning. It could also mean pray you are taken before the tribulation as opposed to after the tribulation. In previous videos, we found that there are two rescues, one at the start of the final three and a half year period and another after the three and a half years. The bride or the multitude of all nations goes at the start to the safe place and the remnant go at the end. It says in Revelation 11 that they arise trembling at the end of that three and a half year period. The texts are clear that the final tribulation lasts 42 months, in other words, three and a half years. If the bride is taken in the summer, then three and a half years later would end in the winter. In other words, Jesus may have been saying, pray you will be taken at the start of the tribulation as opposed to at the end. In Luke 21, Jesus said, pray always that you will be accounted worthy to escape all these things. So in Matthew 24, he may have been saying, pray your flight or escape is not in the winter at the end of the tribulation. If that's the meaning, then that could mean that the rescue and asteroid in impact will occur in the summer. So those are the 17 reasons the summer of 2015 is the biggest watch we've ever looked at. I tried to make this as brief as possible. I know it's a full hour, but there's a lot of details that I wasn't able to cover in this video. So if you want more information, the whole series playlist, Bible's Countdown to the Asteroid, is linked here. And there are several other videos linked in the description below. Just click on Show More to open up more links on this subject. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's making this research possible and making it possible to get this information out to people. Thank you. And if you like this video and want more of these to continue, please consider providing support. I hope you're all doing well, and I'll talk to you next week.